Julian. So if you don't know me, I'm Rick Gold. I'm the chair of the curriculum committee for ILR. And I wanted to, to thank uh, the members and participants of ILR for suggesting courses, because this was one of the courses that was suggested. And it took a little while for us to organize it, but here we are. And in fact, it's interesting because it follows uh, the, the uh, course that we gave last semester on critical race theory. Uh, because both of the courses focus on structural racism or systemic racism. Uh, for critical race theory, it was in the legal system. And when we're talking about the 1619 project, we're talking about the study of history that takes account of uh, systemic racism. So here we are. Uh, today, uh, uh, we're going to be introducing the subject uh, and um, we'll be following it by uh, the six uh, episodes of the uh, Hulu, uh, Hulu program on uh, the 1619 project, uh, which will be encouraging discussion and analysis with you. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Richard McMaster, who's a uh, retired history professor from the University of Florida. And he'll be giving you uh, an overview of uh, the 1619 project and what it means. Thanks. All right, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick. I, I hope everybody could hear me now. I, I don't Put want to- a little closer. What? Oh, just mic, mic a little closer to you. Mel. Oh yeah, okay. Now we're fine. Good, good, good. When I first began teaching at Western Carolina University in 1969, not long after I made the acquaintance of a federal judge from New York who had retired to the Smoky Mountains, and uh, he told me uh, about something that had happened to him early in his career. He was in his last year at Harvard Law School and uh, had been invited by a very prestigious firm in New York City to come for an interview. And riding up in the elevator, and in those days, every elevator had an operator, you may remember that, uh, he couldn't help but tell the operator, uh, this was such a wonderful day. It was the happiest day of his life. And when he got off the elevator, the welcoming committee looked aghast. And someone explained, oh, Mr. Townsend, we're so sorry we couldn't get in touch with you because we hired the person who had uh, been uh, uh, met with us yesterday. And uh, the future judge just stood there, a young, handsome, highly qualified law student who happened to be black. And when he got on the elevator, the elevator operator, who was also an African-American, said, that's how it is. And the two of them, strong men that they were, the two of them burst into tears going down. And uh, he still felt the pain of that many, many years later after a successful legal career. And I mention that story because so often we think about eradicating racism and, and judging people by the color of their skin or where they went to school or where they went to church or whatever. Uh, as something we want to put behind us. 
but uh, the 1619 project calls attention to, it isn't just a matter of you and me and our neighbor down the street changing our attitudes. It isn't just a personal thing. That's all good and well, but the whole uh, impact of the black presence in America over these 400 years and more so permeates American life and institutions that we have to take a hard look at it. And so that's, I think, a significant beginning of understanding the 1619 Project. Now, excuse me, I do want to leave enough time that everybody here can get into the act and, and uh, tell us what you think and how you react to the things we'll be talking about, because that's going to be the whole point of the whole course, not that we just sit back and, and watch a video and are entertained, but that we grapple with these issues that are as they, as they come. So anyway, the uh, 1619 Project was conceived by an African-American woman named Nicole Hannah-Jones. She was, at that time, she's a journalist, still is, she teaches journalism at Howard now, but at that time, she was working full-time for the New York Times Magazine. So that became the vehicle for dealing with something that had been bothering her for a long time through her uh, adult life. Uh, she had grown up as one of a small black minority in Waterloo, Iowa, and went to a school as one of the few public school, and one of the few uh, 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 Negro students in the school. And she was exposed and found it very interesting to the standard elementary school American history. And that usually began with the Pilgrim Fathers and uh, a mission into the wilderness to obtain religious freedom and then to be a beacon to the rest of the world of freedom. And then when those freedoms that they had achieved here, the colonists had achieved, were uh, threatened by the British Parliament, we broke away from England. And then a number of gifted political leaders uh, created uh, the great documents of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and uh, set forth a new nation based on liberty and justice for all. And we continued through the unhappy experience of finally disposing of slavery, which everybody had abhorred anyway, but didn't know how to get out of. And that ended. And then we began to become both an economic, and then as we moved further on into the 20th century, a world power, and finally the uh, main uh, proponent of democracy and its defender around the world. So, yeah, and that's all true. But she said it seemed a little lacking that in that story, people like me were just pawns. We had no agency. White people enslaved us. White people set us free. And then we pretty much disappeared until one day in 1963, Martin Luther King was talking at the mall about not judging people by the color of their skins. 
and then we kind of disappear again. So she was enlightened by a book that was around around that time, a popular, and this may have been in, in high school where she would have had pretty much the same kind of approach to American history, that uh, she read a book by Lenore uh, Bennett, I think that's his right name, I, I may have that syllable backwards there, but it doesn't matter, called Before the Mayflower. And this was kind of a popular history of uh, the African-American experience. And uh, so she found this at Lightly. And by this time, because she's a good deal younger than, than I am, uh, there were all sorts of studies being made by newly minted PhDs in American universities about well, about everything in American history and European history and everything else, but uh, dissertations left and right about slavery, about uh, abolition, about uh, everything, that, and, and uh, the contributions of African Americans, but none of it seemed to get into the uh, ordinary parlance of history. So she wanted to do something more. And since she was working with the uh, New York Times and the New York Times Magazine, she convinced the editor, Mr. Finkelstein, to uh, have a special issue on August 19, uh, 2019, which would mark the anniversary of the arrival of about 20 Africans in a Dutch ship who were unloaded uh, and uh, became in British North America, the first Africans and evidently the first African slaves. So she conceived of this policy, this project, this 1619 project as a new origin story. Yes, we've got the heritage of the pilgrims and the Puritans, and even though they were numerically very much smaller than the number of English colonists who came to Virginia and to the Carolinas and Maryland, Pennsylvania over the years in the 17th century. But that was that was that was our American heritage. And well, we can hang on to that. There's no problem. But let's recognize that something happened when those uh, first African Americans were landed in Virginia. So the uh, you you may remember all of this. The New York Times Magazine came out in August 2019, and it became very difficult if you hadn't had the paper delivered that morning mm -hmm. to find a copy anywhere, it didn't matter where you lived, even if you lived in New York City, because it, it just sold out. And uh, people were immediately responding to this attempt to see uh, the African-American experiences somehow uh, at the heart of and essential to understanding American institutions and American history. Well, it had hardly uh, been sold off the presses than uh, cr criticism began to come. And critics, uh, some of them very distinguished historians, centered on a number of, of issues where the journalistic style had perhaps overstated or a little overplayed what was, you know, that's factual and so on. Some of this initial criticism was simple nitpicking. The 20 Africans were not landed at Jamestown. They were landed at Old Point Comfort, which is down below Hampton. But if you if you've never lived in Virginia, 
you may have no idea where Old Point Comfort is. And if you know anything about American history, you got a pretty good idea where Jamestown is. So that seemed like just simple nitpicking. And some of the other criticisms that came about, signed off by some very distinguished historians, by the way, were uh, two points that were exaggerated and somewhat even misstated. One of them was that the many Americans rallied to the cause of independence in order to protect slavery in the colonies. And it was pointed out by a number of people, even, even the people who fact-checked for the times, that, you know, the British anti-slavery movement in 1776 was pathetically small. You know, we know about Granville Sharp and uh, the Evangelical Anglicans and the Quakers and oh, very many, many more people than that. And uh, they certainly didn't sway Parliament. So w w was slavery in, even after the Mansfield decision, was slavery threatened anywhere in the British colonies? The answer is absolutely no, it wasn't. And the nearest we come where there is some fact here is that when in 1775, Lord Dunmore proclaimed liberty to all slaves who would rally to the British, there may well have been people who said, oh, I was doubtful, but now I know which side I'm on because Dunmore wants to steal all my slaves. So that was a reasonable enough thing. And then again, uh, there was a considerable uh, criticism of the way that Lincoln was handled in one of the essays. And that was that was Lincoln really the great emancipator? Did he fall along step by step? As he once said that if I could save the Union, by freeing all the slaves, I do so. If I could save the Union by not freeing any slaves, I'd do so. And so aren't we putting him in a bad light? And there was one particular historian, a man named Alan Gilzo, a very conservative person politically, who, had, who was indeed an expert on Lincoln, had published a number of books about Lincoln. Uh, uh, to go on that, uh, something happening? Some, is something happening? No, go ahead. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm at the age where I, I expect my, my wife is has just uh, had some kind of attack or something in this. She, she, she's still intact there in the back row. Okay. Anyway, this man, Alan Gelzo, uh, argued that the slaves had absolutely nothing to do with their emancipation in 1865, in 1863. And it was totally the fact that Lincoln and his insight had uh, decided to issue an emancipation proclamation and that they did nothing more to do that. And uh, he became perhaps the most virulent individual critic of the whole 1619 project. And he was connected with the Cato Institute, a number of other uh, very conservative groups, and they began to take up that crusade. So that's part of the story. The uh, other thing that, that the critics were passing over on that was a, or were after on that was the role of the United States colored troops in saving the Union in, in 1861-65. And uh, 
perhaps it was overstated a little bit, but in the in the uh, one of those essays, but the percentage of the Union Army in April 1865, who were in fact U.S. colored troops, was startling because they had managed up to that point to kill and maim so many other Union soldiers that uh, these uh, new recruits were filling in and, and, were, and were really very, very numerous at that time. And again, this, this just seems to be small points that they were criticizing. And, and uh, finally, and I think this was always the crux, was that in that initial uh, presentation, the 1619 project regarded the plantation as, if not the birthplace, certainly the nursery of American capitalism. So it was on that, I think a lot of people bristled and said, oh, this is some kind of left-wing conspiracy and we don't have anything to do with it, and so on. So uh, two more points in those early criticisms. Some of them became uh, so minor that you, you'd think, yeah, you're right, but and, uh, our own Kathleen Deegan, who is a very distinguished uh, archaeologist at uh, UF and has done some wonderful work, contributed to the criticism by pointing out that the people landed in Virginia in 1619 were not the first African slaves in the United States. That as early as 1525, in a short-lived colony in Florida, Spaniards had brought African slaves. So they're not the first. That's not the beginning. Okay, well, that's absolutely true. But it raises the question, when we looked at American history, is it something that evolves from the English colonies and gradually extends over the continent? Or is everything that is part of the United States today and its whole past to be taken as crucial to understanding American history. So do we need to spend a lot of time on what the Russians were doing in Alaska in the late 18th and early 19th century? Or what about the history of the kingdom of Hawaii or where people were, what people were doing in Puerto Rico before 1898? So, you know, you could, you could have it both ways. Both sides are perfectly valid. And uh, a second uh, question was that the, that whole issue about, well, did people uh, opt for independence because they were afraid to lose their slaves? Well, yeah, that a sp certain number of people probably did, but it's that whole fallacy of there's only one explanation, there's only one cause, because it's why students, even elementary school students, should be learning that there are multiple causes for anything and everything, and critically thinking about that, which one is more important, which one influenced the more. So there, there were valid historical criticisms and, and some that perhaps are are uh, of less interest. And, and one that actually never seemed to come up and that intrigued me about 1619 was in a very, very uh, good book that was published, I guess, about 1960 something, uh, Winthrop Jordan, a book called Black Over White, or the other way around, white over black, I'm sorry, uh, talked about 1619 and said, 
there's absolutely no evidence that these people were anything but slaves from day one, okay? And then uh, in, in uh, 1980, uh, Stephen Innes and T.H. Breen, Thomas H. Breen, published a study of Northampton County, Virginia, which is over on the Eastern shore, where from very, very early, from the 1630s on, there were free blacks who were able to own slaves and land, I'm sorry, were able to own land, some of them very small amounts of land, and some of them uh, became fairly good-sized planters on their own. So did that mean that perhaps they had been treated, that first crowd, as, uh, as uh, indentured servants, like English indentured servants or Irish indentured servants, who would be free after a certain amount of time and could be part of the, of the community. And that raises the, inter to me, it raised the interesting question as to which came first or were they both together? That was slavery somehow linked to an abhorrence or a contempt for people of other races or was it simply uh, an economic method that we would exploit the workers no matter who they were or where they came from or whether they looked exactly like the owner of the plantation or they were Africans fresh off the boat? And maybe it was both. Maybe it was exploitation and also race. But it takes until about, well, there's a very early indication in the Virginia statutes around 1649 that there is such a thing as slavery, but it's 1660, sometime after 1619, before there is actually a statute law saying that Africans are slaves for life and their posterity goes with them unless the mother happened to be free. So that was the introduction of the whole thing. Well, I don't want to tire you out with a lot of historical odds and ends, even though this is all about history. So after that, and after that initial uh, wave of criticism that soon spread to, to uh, state legislatures, where we had people who had probably never read the, anything about, about that was published were concerned that the 1619 project would be taught in our public schools or in our state universities and so on. So we have to ban it. So in that next couple of years, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones recruited a number, uh, a very impressive number of uh, first-rate historians, and they put together this very thick book that demonstrates the background to all these issues that had been raised in the original uh, thing. I've got a card sticking, well, there it is. Yeah. Uh, just let me, because I, I'm going to refer to that in a minute. So, uh, this was this was the next stage that came out in 2021, and now two years later, I don't want to take up all the time here. Are we doing? Oh, oh we're all right. Uh, two years later, the uh, same group. By now, there was uh, with the uh, a foundation. There was a whole curriculum for, for uh, elementary schools and high schools around the 1619 project. But uh, by, by 2023, uh, 
Nicole Hannah-Jones had decided to have a series of videos that would take a different angle. The book was scholarly, uh, educational, darn worth dipping into even you don't have to be a a professional historian to want to read it it's very very well done short chapters on, on important topics all right so uh they now she decided that she would introduce these videos and reach people through the hulu channel it's still a new york times project and uh, so the point of these videos is to look at six of these topics through the experience of one family. And it happens because after all, who, what family do you, does anybody know best but their own? It's through the experience of Hannah Jones's Fair family and that background. So it's a personal walk through the Black experience in America and how this uh, influenced so many American institutions. And the, uh, the way we will have them is the first is about democracy, the second is about race, the third is about capitalism, the fourth is about music. The fifth is about fear. And the sixth is about justice. Where do we go from here? And I want to pull this little card out in addition because summing up the whole experience, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones said, and this is a topic for you to chew on and, uh, and, and, and you tell, tell us what you think, that out of slavery and the anti-Black racism it required, nearly everything that was truly, that tr has truly made American exceptionalism grew. So out of slavery and the anti-Black racism it required nearly everything that has truly made American exceptionalism grew. So that's her thought on this uh, very uh, significant topic. And I, I suppose I should stop there. And I, I, I may throw in in the comments one, one other thing I remembered I, I skipped over, but that's all right. So, are we ready for? Yeah, we're ready for comments or questions uh, about uh, the project or about uh, what uh, Professor McMaster just spoke of. Good, Doug. So I'm curious. When I went to school in the 50s and 60s, I didn't hear anything about any of this stuff, obviously. And my son was educated overseas. So I have no familiarity with what's being taught today. Are they getting still the sort of canned stuff that we got maybe in slightly modernized form? Or are they getting at least something about the role of racism in our history and our culture and so on? Oh, I, th I think so. I think that's uh, that's very much grown because actually the the sources are are so available that if you were starting, say, in in uh, nineteen fifty eight or nineteen sixty or something, you, you you didn't find very many books about slavery. There were a couple of good solid studies and. And any of our black history, I know I I I, I taught a class, and introduced it at, at Western Carolina in 1969 on Black America, 
and we had a textbook. So yeah, people were preparing materials to be used at least, certainly at least in college courses at that point. And uh, I like to remember that when we were trying to get this set up, the dean said, how could you have a history of Black America? Those people don't have any history. And uh, but, but there was an awful lot and an awful lot of really first rate scholars uncovered all of that history in the, in the and that's a long time ago, in those succeeding years. And that kind of has been uh, in, included in, in uh, well, all the way down to elementary school, I'm sure. In fact, in fact, uh, I don't want to hog the mic here just, just because I'm holding it, but uh, in fact, the uh, Florida Board of Education just completed a hearing on the standards for teaching African American history in the public schools and in the and in the uh, universities, and uh, Jake Gordon, who's a retired professor, very active in uh, a number of things in in Gainesville, uh, invited me to sit in and look look at the what those standards were. So the and they and they're pretty good. So yeah, I think it's it's permeated very well. So we're not where we were even when uh, uh, Nicole uh, Hannah Jones was first concerned about school. So thanks. Richard, thank you so much for talk, give, bringing this important topic to us. Uh, I just wanted to mention that when you mentioned fear as one of the topics, I heard a beautiful singer with the Winton Marsalis group speak about her experience. She lived in New York City and she said she had a number of sons and every day when any of the sons left the apartment, she feared for their lives. Mm -hmm. And it was very real and I've never forgotten that. Thank you. Coming, Janet. She mentions this in the beginning of her book in the introduction. And I know some of you know this, but the textbooks that are used and particularly the K through 12, textbooks publishers focus on what the big states are doing, Texas and Florida, because obviously they're in the business to sell textbooks. So those states have a greater say in what is included and what is excluded in the textbook. And just recently, the state of Florida was evaluating a whole series of social studies textbooks as to which ones they wanted to officially adopt and probably half of them were declined and it probably was included some of the things that they did not want included so that's something that we need to be aware of this is the k through 12 T colleges probably are different but they want to sell textbooks and Texas and Florida buys more textbooks than North Dakota or New Hampshire. And so they're gearing it to those. So we're not getting maybe the true history that we might with some of the other resources that are available. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Hannah Jones in the book mentions the fact that the state of Texas adopted a high school text that talks about slavery only in terms of workers, as though these were people who turned up at a hiring hall and said, hey, 
I see there's a great job opening up in uh, East Texas, uh, and it it asks for a slave. Well, sure, I'll, I'll go as a slave. Sounds like fun, you know. So they just completely brushed over the fact that this was a coerced labor force. But that's Texas. Richard, can I ask a question that came to my office shortly after the bulletin was published? That I, I took a call um, from an ILR member just kind of questioning after the book was published and the videos came out, was there some controversy or challenge or retraction by um, Ms. Jones herself? Or what, what's... I, I didn't quite get all that. Was there a controversy? What? After the book and the movie came out, did Hannah Jones make some kind of a retraction or something to that effect? I I took a call in my office yeah. with someone kind of challenging me about that. Could you repeat the question? This was wondering whether because of the criticisms you mentioned that there, Hannah Jones did any retraction of uh, what she put in. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, Sorry, I'm not clear. I'm in good company, I suppose, but I, my hearing isn't all that good. So uh, I was going to say, uh, yes, yes, they toned down some of those more extreme statements. So that, for instance, uh, there's a slightly better, uh, friendlier uh, uh, treatment of, of Lincoln and emancipation and uh, and the idea that somehow or other uh, protection of slavery was the major cause of the American Revolution is completely uh, out of there. That the, but that was all kind of a journalistic stuff in the original thing. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, there has been some retraction and some change. And the, the book uh, then is is not saying everything that was in the magazine is absolutely uh, true and we're going to fight for it to the death. They're giving you the background and, the, and how to understand those those issues. So anybody else? Um, does the uh, 1619 project either in the iterate, all of the three inter iterations? You could hold it very start? close to your mouth. We might oh, hear you better. Sorry. Uh, is it on? It yeah. is. It's on. <laughs> Gosh, I have to take my mask off. Yes. Uh, I'm going to get COVID for asking a question. <laughs> Sorry, no offense. Uh, does the uh, project in any of the three uh, forms, the original article, the books, or the uh, Hulu uh, presentations, uh, how do they deal with or do they deal with uh, uh, restitution and uh, sort of monetary repayment for past pro uh, issues. That's, that's going to come up in the last session. And Rick is going to be explaining that and how that works. Yeah, it's in, in the justice section. And uh, of course, it reflects uh, not only the issue of restitution, but also the experience of her family. So it puts that into that context. Good. Good. Uh oh. Uh, Richard, thank you very much. That's uh, been very uh, enlightening and helpful in everybody approaching this course. I'm wondering whether the course will take oh up the goodness. controversy at the University of North Carolina with her position there and the fact that the Board of Trustees put a great deal of pressure on her. And I think tried to uh, take away her tenure track or they, they were trying to, uh, and she was targeted, she felt, Jones. Will that be covered in this course? Yeah, well, I was some, somewhat distracted because oh, I'm sorry. Holly fell over. Oh, my gosh. In front of me here. Oh. I hope she's all right. Yes, of course. 
So, everything okay? I hope so, yes. Do yeah. you want me to repeat my question? What? Do you want me to repeat my question? No, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering whether the course will deal with at all uh, Jones's treatment at the University of North Carolina, which came out, uh, at, she believes, I think most people did, as consequent of her publishing 1619, when they were trying to divert her, I think, tenure track or beginning getting tenure. Uh, and I don't know how that's been settled, but... Uh, yeah, she was invited. She yes. was invited to be in the School of Journalism there, and uh, it was a wish of the faculty and and the administration and everybody. But uh, the contract denied her tenure, which would normally have gone with that professorship, so she didn't accept it, and uh, and that's obviously that was all partly the result of the whole why why did anybody want her in the first place so she went to howard instead so anyway uh that's all i know on that yeah okay anybody else i'll add one thing yeah i just like to add that uh, you know what we're dealing here with is uh a an effort for the society to take a look at a different look at at history and um, to assure that the educational system reflects much of the scholarship that has been going on among historians uh, and it's uh, we're, it's entering into a political dispute about to the degree to which we should be honest about uh, accepting the role of slavery and racism in our history and uh, addressing that honestly th through the educational system. So that's what we're seeing here. Uh, and uh, it's playing itself out uh, in the legislative area as well, in terms of uh, what can and cannot be said in K through 12 or even in the university level about a systemic racism. So that's uh, the, why uh, this course is important, the project is important. Doesn't mean that everything that has been said or stated up till now has been totally accurate. That's why we have a history profession where uh, historians can engage in dialogue. Uh, but uh, this is important, the time is right. And so we're happy to present this course. Don't, don't go yet. I wanted to add one thing that I, I forgot I was going to say earlier, and that is that uh, on the uh, Americans kind of bristled at the idea that, oh, uh, slavery was the backbone of, of our wonderful economy. Uh, the British have been much more uh, willing to face up to that, that the slave trade investment in the slave trade, investment in sugar plantations, investment in uh, cotton plantations around uh, the right up and in, into the uh, 19th century was crucial to the growth of the Industrial Revolution in Britain and provided the, the money to do that, that when they compensated uh, emancipation came in 1833, the enormous amount of public money put into that funded all sorts of enterprises, including a great many American railroads and other such things. And an example has been in the, for just very recently, a series in the Guardian newspaper about the Guardian's complicity in slavery. It's, it's a fascinating story because it turned out that even though the Manchester Guardian, which was the most progressive, most reform-minded newspaper in, the, in, in Great Britain, 
in, in the 19th century, its founder was deeply invested, not just in cotton manufacturing, but in actually having a share in cotton plantations in the sea islands of Georgia and South Carolina. And almost all of the gentlemen who put their money together to found the Manchester Guardian, and a long, long time ago, were heavily invested personally in slave plantations, as well as in the manufacture of cotton goods. So they were owning the production source and they were owning the manufacturing source and they would not have been able to start a newspaper with pocket money if they had not been invested in mm. slavery. So it's, it's just, I, th I think the British have come up very well uh, on that in saying, yeah, our whole darned economy rested, our whole empire rested mm. on the exploitation of African slaves. We're no, no, no beating around the bush. And we need to get to that point because that's pretty well historical. Okay, so thank you all. I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next week. Rick, did you want to mention that we won't be recording the... Uh, no, that's fine. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Now to see if I can stand up. Yeah. Are you all right? Are you all right? <laughs>